we're going to give just a few moments of silent time where you can represent yourself before the throne of God. Use First John 1, 9 if needed. And then I'll pray and finish this out in a group prayer. So let's all bow together. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for providing stability in life. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior, so that no matter what happens in this life, we have the security of being in union with your Son. We thank you and we praise you for the time we get to spend together. In Jesus' name, amen. What do you put in your confidence in? That's what I have to ask. Where do you find your stability in life? Where is your bedrock? Where is your truck? Well, our verse coming up has to do with the issue of stability. It has some other gold nuggets we're going to find in there also. And I want to look at verse 12, which we... Uh, looked at last week and then continue on to verse 13. Paul finished his prayer, praying for the super grace believer, and then he comes on in verse 12 and says, But I want you to know, brethren, that is, born again believers, royal family members, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And so we saw last week that this is a similar passage uh, as Romans 8:28, where God is working everything out for the good. We also looked at Joseph and how he went through life and it all turned out for the good. And Paul here is saying God is in this and he's working it out for the good. And we learned the principle that God can even take our bad decisions and use them for good. That is, we may get out of fellowship. We may even get into reversionism. And we may pursue the wrong lifestyle. But God can even use our stupid decisions that we made back there in carnality. When we come out of the other side over here and get back with it, we're going to find out that even back here when we were wayward, that God was working it for the good. The same thing happened to Paul. He got into religious reversionism, and he took an oath. He nearly got killed had it not been for the Roman military that saved his hind end from a crowd who was ready to stone him. And here he is in jail. He's actually under house arrest in verse 13. So that it, it has become evident to all to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. I want to come back to uh, examine this verse a little bit more, and then we're going to study uh, some other verses to go with it. We start out with a conjunction hoste, and it should be translated with the result that. So he's going to say. These things that are happening, they're resulting in something. With the result that, ego desmos, that is my imprisonment. Uh, many times you have my chains or my shackles, but we understand that Paul was actually not shackled. He was actually under house arrest. He had freedom. He had a nice house. He had access to fun. He had access to uh, the warriors here that uh, he's going to have an impact with. So it actually shouldn't be my change. You'll be thinking about Paul under house arrest. Desmos here means my imprisonment. Uh, in the original Greek, the next phrase is in Christo. That is the preposition en plus the locative of Christos, which is Christ. And you have... Uh, 
I'm not sure if you have in Christ, but it should be I in Christ. And that, we understand, is the top circle. That is positional truth. That is the stability of life. We're going to come back to that thought. My imprisonment in Christ has become, you know, my aorist active infinitive, has become known or well known, phaneros. In holos praetorion, that means in the Praetorian Guard, the Praetorian Guard. I want to stop and talk about the Praetorian Guard because we have the uh, the word Praetorian here, and many of your Bibles say palace. What does yours say? Does it say palace guard? Palace guard? Is that what you have? Praetorian? A Praetorian, originally the word came from the general or the commander's tent. So if you had the Roman army and they were out in the field and you were looking for the commander, commanding officer, he would be in the praetorium, in the commanding general tent. Well, as this word progressed, we find out that one of the emperors actually moved his crack troops, his best warriors, his most skilled and advanced uh, people in his army. Not only were they good at killing the enemy, but they were smart. He took 10,000 of the best troops from the Roman military and he moved them by Caesar's palace, by the palace for security so that they become the Praetorian Guard. Now, as this thing rolled along, these guards actually gained political favor. In other words, they were such elitists and they had such great minds that they had a heavy influence on what happened politically in Rome. So that many times when they were looking for a leader for the new emperor of Rome, the emperor would have to pay off the Praetorian Guard, and he would offer them bribes. He would say, if you um, advance my agenda, if you say, well, this guy needs to be the next emperor, and that's how it happens, uh, you need to give us $100,000 apiece. And then we will say, this is your new emperor, and we will protect you. And that was their job, to protect the emperor. So that many times, uh, what would happen is, as the uh, person who wanted to get elected would offer a generous bribe. If I get elected, I'll give you $175,000 apiece. You go ahead and promote me. And this is how many times leaders came to power in Rome. But also, if the emperor started getting a little fat-headed and getting a little arrogant and started make, making uh, some really bad decisions, guess who took care of business? The Praetorian Guard would execute that emperor. And it happened before. And so uh, we see that they were very, very powerful and elite military unit, 10,000 of these soldiers who lived in and around uh, the uh, palace in Rome, and Paul himself is under house arrest, and guess who he's going to get the witness to? Some street rabble, right? No, he's going to get to witness to the elite warriors of Rome, the most powerful men in Rome. He's going to have an impact. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go ahead and give you a point of doctrine. You can't have an impact on an elite warrior, a military man like this, unless you have self-discipline. You got that? In other words, these guys had so much self-discipline that 
uh, they were under command, under authority, and they had strict lives. And do you think if Paul was sloppy in the way he acted, and he just had a real sloppy type of life, that he would have had any impact on them? No. It would have gave him a moment's notice. <laughs> but they saw this old man, and they saw how fired up he was. And they saw his self-control. That was taught as part of his Jewish upbringing. His self-control. And his great self-discipline. And they said, this right here is a man of authority. And not only does he wield great authority, but he has great humility also. And so Paul had an impact among these men. And that's coming up in verse 14. Now, I want to get ahead of myself. So with the Praetorian Guard, Paul had a great rapport. He had a witness. And it also says, and to the rest, uh, and to all the rest. And so this would have been anyone in the periphery of where Paul was staying at. Now, I want you to come back to the phrase, in Christ. Because we have the locative case, and that points right to the cross in two circles. Let me go through about it. And you know, at the moment of your salvation, God the Holy Spirit took you out of Adam, and he placed you in Christ. And there is your eternal union with God. In the top circle, you have perfect stability. You have perfect security. Uh, Romans 8, 38 and 39 says that nothing can remove you from that top circle. And so Paul is saying here, my stability in this whole thing, they understand that I'm in Christ. Now, I want to tell you the mentality behind this. Because when most people get thrown in jail, they think their life is over. They give up totally on everything. They say, I, I had a dream of, of getting married getting married and having children. Now that dream is over. Or I had a dream of being great in business and uh, becoming a millionaire. And now that dream is over. Well, that didn't happen to Paul. Paul simply took a objective look at his life. He recognized that he had made an error. And he immediately got back in God's will for his life. And he understood that now this was God's plan for his life. So that Paul, in prison, in jail, was going to write four different letters. And those four letters are going to advance you all the way up in this ultra super grace. And so we see here, he says, my chains are in Christ. This is my stability. Even though you may think, and everybody else thinks, that when they get thrown in jail that everything is gone, guess what? It This has purpose, guys. And this is your stability in life. So let's stop and look at the subject of being, of having stability. I want you to turn back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 24, 724. What about stability in life? We're looking for stability in life. Matthew seven twenty-four. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, actually Jesus is speaking of his teaching. Matt, uh, he has been teaching here, the Jewish people, 
in Israel, his follower. And he says, whoever hears and takes in this communication of doctrine, what I've been teaching, and does them. That's the application of truth, the life experience. Remember the last thing we talked about Sunday morning? The application. If you ever make it to application, you'll know the power of God. And does them, I will liken him to a wise man. Remember, wisdom is the application of doctrine. Who built his house on the rock. It's funny because I was talking to Randy Duncan earlier and they, the REA just built a brand, big, brand new office on Highway 8. And uh, I said, man, I can't believe how much dirt work they did out there. He said, yeah, you know, he said there was an ancient pond underneath where they surveyed to build that building. He said, they dug down there about, they did a sonar and they found this stuff underground. And they dug down there and about six foot underground, there were petrified stumps and water. And uh, they said, you know, these big corporations the ones that bid on the job. And they didn't bid on having to do this much dirt work. You know what they had to do? Because it was so mushy and boggy right there where they were going to put this multi-million dollar facility out there. They had to take and mix the dirt with cement. And they brought in a huge machine and they would put a layer of dirt and then they would put Portland cement, the sand type cement, and then that machine would blend it together and then they would pack it down. It made a hard layer. And then they'd have to do another layer uh, underneath it because they, whoever surveyed, they, they didn't catch the, the underground pond. And that building, if they'd have built that building on there, that concrete would have cracked everywhere. The bricks would have cracked like this building on the outside. It would have been terrible. And that would have been a waste of money building that building because they had to tear it down several years later. Well, Jesus, he's a carpenter. You get it? He knows about building on a foundation. And he understands the importance of uh, picking a good site. Can you imagine building that home and saying, these people are going to have us back here in a couple of years. We're on top of bog. Jesus is saying, Whoever takes this doctrine that I'm teaching and they take it in their soul and they apply it to their life has a rock solid foundation. Rock solid. You say, why is that important? Because nothing else is stable. Nothing else is stable. Here's what you're going to find out your friends are stable, they're not stable. You can't rely on them. Your friends are liable to turn their back on you. They're probably talking bad about you right now. Get used to it. People aren't stable. Your family members aren't stable. They may not always be there. He's looking at me like, well, they may not always be there. People die. People get sick. Things happen to humans. They can't be your stability. They can't. Governments aren't stable. You got that? That's easy right now. Governments aren't stable. And even when you look at populations of people, they can become unstable if you, if you promote racism and you promote class warfare and you promote um, the battle of the sexes. Whole populations can become unstable. Huh. Does that sound familiar? So that we live in a life of instability. I noticed outside it's getting cloudy right now. The atmosphere is unstable. And we can, in Arkansas, we can go from bluebird day to tornado in about 45 minutes. 
Yes, we can. It can be the it, it's liable to be raking icicles off in the next couple of weeks. I'm just making a joke, but we've had some wild weather, haven't we? It's unstable. The Earth's crust. You're riding on crust. It's not stable either. There's fault lines even in Arkansas. And so we live in a world of instability. And Jesus says, if you take these doctrines which I am teaching and you make them a part of your soul and you apply them to your life, you have built a paradigm, a system of thinking on something stable. And what he's saying is, when you're walking through life with doctrine, you understand you're living in an angelic conflict, a spiritual battle, and you see wars over here, and you see rumors of wars over here, and you see conflict erupting, and you see the economy starting to crash, and you see that the Middle East is becoming a melting pot, and you see class warfare, that's the rich, the poor against the rich. And you see uh, race warfare and the warfare of the sexes. Guess what? You're not riding on any of that. You're riding on truth so that you don't have to panic and you don't have to worry and you don't have to fear. Because God's Word and His truth and your position in Christ are totally stable. Totally stable. Verse 25, And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. And that rock is Christ in in not only Christ, but his teaching here. It's kind of funny. He's got three different categories of of uh, things that happen here. And these are the pressures of life, the adversities that we face. I just talked to two different people who found out they had tumors. And uh, guess what? If they have doctrine... They're totally stable about it. It's in God's hands. But if if they don't, verse 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine are teaching the doctrine that he was teaching to the Jewish people and does not do them, he will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and and great was its fall. That's the person walking around on earth, minus doctrine. They may be born again. They've got no Bible teaching. Ain't got an errand. No Bible truth. No doctrine circulating in their stream of consciousness. They've got nothing stable to hold on to in life. There are people that are panicking all over the place about what to do, falling apart. The pressure and the adversity of life has just made them come apart at the scene. And so Paul, in the middle of his distress, says, These chains are in Christ. There's my stability. God is in control of human history. Jesus Christ is. I am in union with Christ. That is my stability in life. Nothing can break that union. Isaiah 33.6 Isaiah 33.6 says, Doctrine shall be the stability of thy time. That is, biblical truth inside the soul shall be the stability of thy time. 
Why can't we trust in man? Why can't we find stability in man? Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is desperately wicked. Every man has a sin nature. And people change. People may have doctrine and they may change their list of standards. They may change their viewpoint. Turn over to Matthew 24, 5. If you're in Matthew, turn to 24, 5. Matthew 24, 5. I've got the wrong verse written down, but he says my word will last forever, and he's talking to the Jews about all the different adversities that they're about to go through in the tribulation. I like to read some of this because it applies to today. He says, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. This is during the tribulation when the Jews are hiding in the wilderness. They're being protected, and they're going to be trying to be lured out by Satan so that he may kill them. Verse 6, and you will hear wars and rumors of wars. That's hot wars and cold wars. See that you're not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will become offended and betray one another and will hate one another. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. That doesn't mean spiritual saved. That means save his physical body will be saved because he makes it to the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes back. Verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in, in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. We always see grace before judgment. But Jesus says, my words will endure forever. I want you to turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, and that's the last turn I'll make you do. Ephesians chapter 4. And I want you to see the instability of reversionism. The instability. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Ephesians 4, 17, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. That is the word ethnos. It means unbeliever. Unbelievers walk in the futility, the matiote of their mind. That's the vacuum of the soul that sucks in blackness, sucks in false doctrine. Verse 18, having their understanding. That's their soul. Darkened. That's scotizo. That's the that's what happens. That's what sucks in when you leave when you leave doctrine behind, the mateotes, the vacuum in the soul, it sucks in whatever's out there. And the scotizo, the darkness here, is the blackout of the soul, the false doctrine that comes in to the soul. 
being alienated, that means separated from the life of God. There's no fellowship here because of the ignorance that is in them. The main problem we have as Christians is our ignorance because of the porosis of their heart, the scar tissue over their heart. They've rejected God's will for their life so long they've developed scar tissue on the right lobe. And it goes on to describe their activities. Paul would say that we no longer need to be cast about and crashed on the shoals of reversionism, unstable. So that now we've seen everything that can be unstable in life. Let's look at one thing that is stable. Turn. I'm going to turn to Romans 8, 38 and 39. Romans 8, 38 39. I hate to give too much away because we're going to be right here at the top circle on Sunday morning within a short amount of time. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, look, Islam may try to kill you. So what? Take as many of them out as you can on your way. You got it? That's orders from your commanding general. But if they kill you, guess what they can't do? They can't take you out of Christ. They can't. Neither death nor life, nor angels, or nor principalities, nor powers. That's, that's categories of fallen angels. Even though all hell stands against you, son, they can't take you out of Christ. Satan would love nothing more than to torture Christians. I saw some videos of some Muslims that were in Europe. They were out in the street. They'd stripped their clothing off, and they were beating one another mercilessly. They're just punching each other, beating each other up. And I looked at that for about 45, I saw that for about 30 seconds. And I said, if you want to see some demon activity, that right there is it. Demon activity is seek and destroy. Just like the demons that got thrown into the swine, what happened immediately? They ran off and plummeted off the cliff so that all the, hog, all the swine died. And here are these Islam in Europe, they're fixing to have a big problem. And they're beating one another. Well, look right here. They can't touch you. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. No demon can indwell you. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. That's different grades of fallen angels. Nor things present, nor things to come. That means what's happening in the world right now can't take you out of Christ. What if you got cancer? Can't take you out of Christ. There's your stability. What if you get cancer in the future? Can't take you out of Christ. There's your stability. What if wars happen? What if America does go to a third world nation in our time? Can't take you out of Christ. And God promises he's not going to forsake his people. That ought to be a good impetus for you to get the super grace as soon as possible. Because God protects super grace believers. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the top circle. Nothing can take you out. And Paul is pointing to this very doctrine as the sole stability in his life. When everything else, when anybody else would have fallen apart, would have been crying in the corner, Paul points to God's plan for his life, and he points to his own stability <coughs> in Christ. 
So I'm going to go back and read our verse as it stands in my New King James. And we're going to finish out right there. Verse 13. So that it has become evident to the whole praetorian guard and to all the rest, everyone else in my periphery, that my chains or my imprisonment are in Christ. This is part of God's purpose and plan for my life, and this is my stability. Well, my challenge to you is 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 that you'll find stability and that you'll learn more about your position in Christ. The only stable thing that, that uh, we have nowadays is our position in Christ. There's hardly anything else you're going to see in life that is absolutely stable. So I thank you for your attention and attendance.